But first, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The defining event in the world's largest religion. Now one man claims he has new evidence. It not only throws doubt on the location of the holy sites in Jerusalem, but also reveals the true story of the passion of Jesus Christ. For Christians, Jerusalem is the holiest place on earth. Millions of pilgrims flock here every year to trace the final steps of Christ and worship where he died on the cross. They follow the Via Dolorosa, or Way of Suffering, a winding path through the heart of the ancient city. It's believed to be the route along which Jesus carried the cross from the site of his trial to the place where he suffered his agonizing death. It ends here, at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Beneath a sacred altar is a slab of exposed bedrock known as the Rock of Calvary. This is the climax of any Christian's pilgrimage. The devoted wait patiently in line to touch the exact piece of earth which held their Saviour's cross. But Professor Shimon Gibson of the University of North Carolina thinks they are worshipping in the wrong place. He has carried out an archaeological investigation around the Rock of Calvary. What he found has made him question whether this rock could possibly be the site of Christ's crucifixion. What you can see is the top of the rock itself, which is restricted on all sides by icons and other paraphernalia. Archaeologically speaking, when you measure it all out and you plot it, you can see that the area of the Rock of uh, Calvary is actually quite restricted. And I've investigated the top of this rock. It will be very difficult to crucify one person, let alone three people, on top of this uh, narrow uh, space here. Gibson believes his archaeological research confirms that not just the crucifixion, but other key events in the story of Christ's passion could not have happened where Christian tradition dictates. Tradition is important, I think, for Christian believers. But uh, for me as a scientist, I want to actually be able to touch the actual uh, rock uh, which was connected to those events which are depicted in the Gospels. Shimon is out to discover what more archaeology can reveal about why, how, and where the crucifixion took place. He starts with the basic question, why crucifixion in the first place? From his research of texts dating back from the time of Jesus, Shimon knows that crucifixion was brought to Jerusalem by the Romans. Okay, pleasure to meet you. Very nice to meet you. He contacts historical guide Gaston Chachi in Rome, the city where crucifixion was perfected. So who were the people who were crucified? In Rome, of course, it was, uh, it was pretty widely spread. Uh, for example, a slave you know, sort of rebelling against his master. And any other crime that would have been related to crime against the state. Are there any places in Rome in particular uh, associated with crucifixion that you can think of that uh, would help me? What I suggest really there are two sites that are most important. One is the city gate, uh, and that's where the slaves would have been uh, crucified. And the other site is uh, the Appian Way.
The Appian Way was the grand thoroughfare that connected Rome with the southern provinces. In 71 BC, after the crushing of a huge slave revolt led by Spartacus, this major road was lined with crosses. 6,000 rebel slaves were stripped, whipped, and then crucified. Sometimes uh, death will arrive after two, three days. They will be left there as long as possible until the vulture will come and rip their flesh, uh, until dogs will start taking part of the bodies away. Don't forget that those, those guys, uh, for those three days, they've been uh, defecating, urinating on their own, on their own self. The stench would have been absolutely horrific here. That was the propaganda message of Rome. Uh, Spartacus will never exist anymore. According to the Gospels, Christ is tried as the King of the Jews. Roman governor Pontius Pilate famously washes his hands of the case. But the implication is that Christ presents a threat to the Roman Empire. And that is the reason why he's crucified. Although there are many chronicles that record the terrible fate of victims who were crucified, what is surprisingly absent is specific detail of how they were crucified. Depictions of Christ's death generally show him pinned to a heavy wooden cross by means of three long nails, two hammered through his palms and another through both feet. But Gibson has developed a radical new theory as to how he believes people were actually crucified. And he's keen to put his claims to the test. What's clear is that once Jesus was lying on the cross, there was an importance of being able to position him on the cross. Hence, you have these two pieces here. One to hold the feet down here and another piece which was there to uh, be under his buttocks to hold him in, in position. The next stage, and Nitsan, if you can help me, was to tie the, 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 the arms to the cross. This was done with uh, uh, ropes, we, we think, and the reason for that is that if the person had been uh, nailed uh, to the, the cross beam, Without the use of ropes, uh, the body would uh, fall forwards and the person would have uh, asphyxiated on the spot. Allowing victims to asphyxiate or choke was something the Romans wanted to avoid at all costs. It meant a relatively quick death, the very opposite of what crucifixion was all about. Once that had been done, then it's possible that uh, nails were used. Uh, the nail will be placed into the palm of uh, the person for two reasons. Uh, first, because it would prolong the agony of the person who's on the cross, but also uh, as a security uh, element. If anybody of uh, the family members of that uh, person wanted to take the body off the cross by simply cutting the ropes, then it would have been very difficult to do so because of uh, the nails which are in position. I think the traditional way of uh, depicting Jesus hanging on the cross without ropes is an impossibility. Gibson is keen to run his rope theory by one of the world's leading authorities on crucifixion. The University of Tel Aviv owns the only archaeological evidence ever found of an actual crucifixion. The grisly artifacts are in the care of Professor Israel Hershkovitz. So what do we have in this box, uh, Israel? Surprise. <laughs> well, we have the, uh, the only evidence, the sole evidence worldwide for crucifixion. Amazing. Exhibit number one is a human bone, discovered in a cave a few miles north of Jerusalem. What you can see here is the, the right heel bone. It dates from around the time of Christ and has one conspicuous feature. It's pierced right the way through by an iron nail. The nail actually 
is penetrating through the lateral aspect of the heel so bone. the center of the heel bone. An experiment by Professor Hershkovitz's team has shown that it was done with great skill. This is a typical Roman nail uh, in size and shape, and if you don't put the nail in the right point, you easily miss the heel bone. And even we, professional anatomists, I mean, we miss the heel bone. And this uh, tells you that the, uh, the, the Roman soldiers who were engaged with crucifixion were very professional. So they knew something about anatomy? They knew a lot about anatomy. At least they knew, they knew how to crucify people. I can tell you that. It's clear from the heel bone that nails were used in the act of crucifixion. Gibson doesn't deny the use of nails, but he feels victims must have been suspended by rope. Uh, if you're um, executing a lot of people, you want it to be fast, you want it to be efficient. Yes. Isn't it logical to assume that they would have roped up as many people as possible and that the nails might have then been added simply in order to make sure that they wouldn't be taken down or something like that? But imagine to yourself the scene of crucifixion. You take some, someone, you whip, you whip him almost to death, you know. He's full of blood and then you bring him to the cross, you know. You nail his leg, and then at the end, what you do, you just tie the, the hand to the, to, to, the, uh, to the crossbar. It doesn't fit the thin. Professor Hershkovitz is adamant that victims of crucifixion were fixed to the cross by means of nails alone. He thinks they were hammered through both heels and through both hands. And I can prove it. Yes. I can prove it. There are three nails coming from Abba Cave. Is this the, what we're looking at here? Yeah, this is this is this is the uh, uh, this is the box. So let's just very carefully take the nails out. The nails were hammered through the hand of a crucified man. We know that for sure, because one of them is still attached to a human hand bone. You can see easily the nail is passing through one of the small bones of the palm of, of, of the hand. And what the bone remnants tells us is actually that that the nail didn't pass through the palm of the hand from the front, but rather from the, from the back. The fact that the nail went through the back of the hand is a vital clue. It has led Professor Hershkovitz to develop an entirely new account of how crucifixion was carried out. Imagine to yourself, the hand wasn't this way, but came from the back of the crossbar, and the nail came from here. So his, his arm was wrapped around the crossbar from the back. Exactly. This, this why, and this, to hold him this way, there is no way that he, he, will, he will fall forward. Yes. You know? So that was yes. holding him actually on the cross. By using the crossbar to support the weight of the body, he's demonstrated that victims could be nailed to a cross with no need for ropes but he's also shown that nails weren't used in the way that people thought they were. The long nail that was used to pin the victim's feet to the cross went in from the side, through the heel bone, and not through the front. And the smaller nails that pierced the hands were hammered in through the backs of the hands, not through the palms, as everyone has previously supposed. Professor Gibson believes he's finally found out just how Jesus was crucified. Now he wants to investigate where his trial and crucifixion took place. According to the Gospels, Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate on the morning of Good Friday. In medieval tradition, this is the starting point, where we are at the moment. And this tradition is encapsulated within this tablet, which has been inserted in the 19th century into this archway. So I'm looking at the buildings here, and I can't find anything, as an archaeologist, that I can associate with the trial of Jesus. In fact, I find the evidence relating to the trial and uh, the route that Jesus took to the place of crucifixion in an entirely different part of Jerusalem. Christian tradition places Christ's trial and the route to his crucifixion in the northeast quarter of Jerusalem. But Gibson believes it actually happened in the west of the city, 
near the Jaffa Gate, suggesting a completely different route. The massive walls that now surround the city were built over 500 years ago by Suleiman the Magnificent. They stand here on the same site as an earlier Roman wall. An archaeological dig, attended by Gibson, uncovered the remains of a gate leading into the palace of Herod, inside the city. Gibson believes this is the place where Christ stood trial. Here we have archaeological remains which date from that period, can be associated with the trial of uh, Jesus, fits uh, the, the gospel account and uh, gives you a better sort of understanding of what took place at the trial. Here we have uh, steps. There will be a large gate here. The gate, of course, is uh, destroyed, but we have the, the entrance area. It would have led into a very large area here which was uh, covered with paving, and this stone pavement is referred to in the Gospel of John. But something else exists in the Gospel of John. There's a reference to it being at the place of Gabata, which is Aramaic for the rocky protuberance. And over here you can see uh, the rocky protuberance. And Pontius Pilate would have sat up there on his tribunal and would have dealt with the trial. And as soon as the trial had been completed, Jesus would have been led up here through this gate. And all that remains of this gate are these few steps, these rock-cut steps. But Jesus would have been led through these uh, steps into the city. For me as an archaeologist, the challenge is really to separate tradition uh, from archaeology. And here we have the scientific evidence relating to the trial of Jesus. Professor Gibson is sure that archaeology has revealed the place where Jesus was condemned to death. But can archaeology help reveal the place of execution? He claims he's found evidence that it's actually close to the traditionally accepted site, underneath the church of the Holy Sepulchre. For Shimon, his archaeological research has ruled out the Rock of Calvary as the exact spot of the crucifixion. But he thinks it could have been a natural marker, used to direct people to it. The rock which is shown today as the place of the crucifixion, it actually marks the spot of the crucifixion, but it's not the place of the crucifixion. In, in, in other words, it's almost like a signpost. This is the way to the place of the crucifixion. If he is correct, then the actual place Christ was crucified has been lost and buried somewhere beneath the floor of this church. Shimon believes he can use archaeology to direct him to the true place of Christ's crucifixion. Part of this great medieval church is built on the foundations of a much earlier 4th century basilica constructed by the Emperor Constantine and it marked the exact spot where Christ was then believed to have been crucified. Gibson believes the apse, the most important part of Constantine's church containing the altar, is a much more likely location. If Gibson is right, and he can locate the 4th century apse, then he will have found what he believes to be the true site of the crucifixion. In a section of the church, Gibson has discovered remnants of the original Constantine building. Here you have the wall, which dates from the time of Constantine the Great. It's part of the overall church, and below it you can see the rock, the actual natural rock, which slopes up, and it terminated in the area of the apse. Following the natural rock line to its end leads Gibson to a flat plateau that is now paved. I think, based on the historical evidence, that this medieval pavement overlies the apse of the Church of Constantine. So if I was to lift up these paving stones, I would probably find the actual rock, the actual place of the crucifixion. It's unlikely the faithful will be swayed by Gibson's evidence. But if he is right, he has succeeded in piecing together a new 
and radically different account of one of the most significant events in religious history. Jesus Christ's final hours on earth.